You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You're listening to the Archaeology Show. TAS goes behind the headlines to bring you the real stories about archaeology and the history around us. Welcome to the podcast. Hello and welcome to the Archaeology Show, episode 225. On today's show, we talk about the back door to hell, the Dutch Stonehenge, and the age of bamboo. Let's dig a little deeper, but not too deep, because you could have a big rolling stone coming up behind you (laughs) to seal up the back door to hell. (laughs) Welcome to the show, everybody. How's it going? Good. I'm currently looking at the ocean. Nice. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty cool. We're in a nice little spot on the Oregon coast, Mm -hmm. just south of Yahats, Oregon. Spelled Yachets, if you're trying to find it on a map. Yes. <laughs> it does not look like it should be pronounced that way, for right. sure. <laughs> right. Uh, we're going to a similarly confusing place in a little bit called Squim, spelled Sequim. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I nope. definitely said Sequim the first time when you looked at me like, yeah. what? And I'm yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> Sequim. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Anyway, mm-hmm. we are also recording this on video, so... Mm-hmm. We've kind of figured out a way to maybe do this through our Zencaster hosting platform and then match up the good audio with that. Because we're in the same place, it's hard to do it like everybody else does. Yep. It'd be easier if we were like in separate studios. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and going from one end of the RV to the other just isn't comfortable. You don't have good backgrounds and it's just... No, and then yeah. it's laggy. Like I can hear you talking yeah. out front if I'm in the back. <laughs> it's distracting. But it takes a second to come through. So yeah, yeah. it's just... It so anyway, better. so yeah, a little peek behind the scenes on what we're trying to do here. Yeah, <laughs> so go search Archaeology Podcast Network on YouTube if you happen to be listening to the audio of this. If you're listening to the YouTube version of this, you can go over to arcpodnet.com and find out all the other great podcasts that we have over there, including episodes of this show and a lot of other shows over there too. We mm-hmm. have over three thousand five hundred, almost four thousand episodes in our back catalog mm-hmm. over the last eight, almost nine years. Mm-hmm. So pretty cool. All For right. Sure. So in this news episode, we're going to start with a wholesome story about archaeologists finding the back door to hell. (laughs) So, yeah. Sounds very dramatic. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) This is, uh, I mean, the one I pulled was from Popular Mechanics because it was done fairly well, but it links to what's essentially a press release, Mm -hmm. not really a paper yet. Yeah. And and I'm linked to that too in the show notes here, but... There's also a few others that have called this, you know, various things, but everybody says backdoor to hell because that's what the Franciscan monk called it, basically. And we'll talk we'll talk about him. Mm-hmm. Actually, he's a Dominican scholar, not really mm-hmm. a monk. Anyway, he's not even Franciscan. He's Dominican. His name is Francisco. Okay, so. <laughs> All right. So let's Francisco, go back to the beginning here. <laughs> Francisco de Borgoa. And for those listening on YouTube, my notes are over here. Rachel's are to her right. Yes. (laughs) So that's why we're looking off screen. Francisco de Borgoa. uh, Borgoa. Borgoa? B-U-R. Borgoa? 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 Maybe. I don't know. B-U-R-G-O-A. Interesting thing is, he's actually, I mean, it wasn't called Mexican at the time, but he's born in Mexico. Oh, okay. We'll talk about that later. He's a 17th century Dominican scholar. And writing in 1674, he told of a journey, or an account really, of exploring subterranean temples That contained four interconnected chambers. Hmm. Okay, so that's where this whole legend of this whole thing kind of starts. Mm -hmm. And we are going to have a bonus segment for this episode. And the bonus segment has a little bit about his life. Yeah. Because his was pretty interesting. So tune in for the bonus segment. If you can't see the bonus segment or don't know what I'm talking about, it's because you're not a member of the (laughs) APN like (laughs) over 150 other people are. So (laughs) go to arcpodnet.com forward slash members and join other members. We had three or four join just this week. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember the exact number, but anyway, join us over there. Anyway, he was with a group of Spanish missionaries, and they found the tombs of priests and kings of... Now, this is get, this gets a little confusing. Teo Zapotlan is mm-hmm. what it says. But really, this is the Zapotec industry, okay. or, or co- culture, I should say. Yeah, yeah. Um, we get into a little bit of that later, too. But it's a mixture between... By this time, when they found this area, it's a mixture between Zapotec and Mixtec people. Okay, yeah. They came together, and the second half of the bonus segment is talking about this archaeological complex that's here. Mm. The second most famous complex in all of Mexico, Mm -hmm. the first most famous in this area. Yep. Anyway, 
they were checking out these subterranean chambers here and they found a stone door, much like you would find in a horror movie. And <laughs> it's already underground. <laughs> yeah. And they found this stone door. That is crazy. That led to a cavern <laughs> that they said was as deep as 90 miles. Wow. Now, they don't mention anything about exploring it. I don't okay. know how they know how they measure 90 miles in pitch dark. Right. It's hard to do that now. Yeah. You don't even get GPS down there. Right, right. So but- they said it was complete with intersecting passages and pillar supported roof. Huh. Oh, interesting. So, so it was built. like they they dug the cave out more to make it bigger. Or not dug it because it's rock. Well, but these guys like, just found it behind a door. They just found it and like turned. Okay. And they were like, what the hell is this? No, but like the people that use the space. Oh, like, well, nobody like, knows. Okay. Yeah. We don't know how mm-hmm. it was built. We just have his account of it. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm really skeptical about the whole 90 miles thing. Yeah. I really don't think that that could be accurate. But what that does indicate is that they thought it was so massive that they couldn't see the end. Mm-hmm. They couldn't get to the end. It right. was it was big enough for them to say, this is gigantic. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. that that part is probably true. Kind of like the 40, 40 days and 40 nights thing from the Bible. Right. right. Like the, right. maybe 90 miles just means like some massive length yeah. that they couldn't really measure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or like how the seven days that God took to create the heavens and the earth is really like a billion years for each one. (laughs) If you're going to try to make that equal something. Well, yeah. Yeah. If you're trying to conform the Bible to science. But I mean, good luck with that. (laughs) Because how can there be days when there was no earth to measure a day? (laughs) It's it's really, there's a lot of questions there (laughs) that will go unanswered. (laughs) Anyway, the priest, which is what he was, being a priest, feared this to be the back door to hell because he was just scared by it and sealed it off forever. I mean, it is kind of scary sounding like a random door in a cave. Sure. Yeah. And the picture that popular mechanics used is basically something out of like a mega like death a, album cover like a fiery hellscape <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> door <laughs> yeah it's like an orange glowing door open yeah. with fire coming out of it yeah it wasn't like that it was just I, a stone I'm door sure not. yeah anyway the long-standing legend from the actual people of the area the zapotex and i get more into this in the bonus segment mm-hmm. uh, but they told of the existence of this quote-unquote back door to hell and and a lot of people just didn't believe it mm-hmm. so it wasn't just his account it was a, a cultural myth as well okay. and it might be from his account i don't know but it's a lot I and mean, we'll talk about that in a minute so they kind of it sounds like he, they he found the door sealed it off and it just sort of entered into myth Kind of. And we didn't really have any actual accountings of the store again. Is that's that, what it sounds like. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's what it where sounds we're like. At. Yeah. So, but it turns out it was right where it was. The legend said it was all along. Oh. Nobody just bothered to look. Yeah. <laughs> what, or at least, really? we, at least we think it is. Uh, we'll get to that. <laughs> okay. They're not quite done. Yeah. It's underneath what's called the ancient church group site. Now the church group, what they call this, there's, I can't remember now. I just did the research. Four or five groups at the Mitla ruins. It's called Mitla, um, mm-hmm. this archaeological area. Mm-hmm. And... The church group is just one of the groups that has been, you know, really looked at closely, restored, actually. Okay. And there's another one called the Columns Group, which has actually also been restored. Both of those are open to the public. Okay. What this group did is they used ancient legend and modern technology, basically, to find what they think is a temple complex that he was referring to underneath the ground. Okay. So they just started connecting the dots between what he said and what they were looking at on the ground. Yes. And the entrance to the chamber system is known as the temple of, I'm going to get this wrong again, um, Lyoba, L-Y-O-B-A-A. That's what the Zapotec called it. Uh Yeah. And Lyoba was, uh, is the word for, what was it, like death or something like that Mm -hmm. in the Zapotec language. Okay. Death or rest. It's a it's a place of 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 dead people anyway. Yeah. And, and you know, reverence and things dead like that. Dead and rest are often yeah. like sort of interchangeable in right. a lot of cultures, yeah. myths and legends and things. Exactly. And this is in the southern Mexican state of Oaxaca, and it is the most famous archaeological ruins is the Mitla Ruins, mm-hmm. which is this entire complex of groups. Mm-hmm. So again, we talk about Mitla a little more in the bonus. There's a lot of cool things about it. So be sure to tune into that. It's probably pronounced Mitla. Mitla? Mitla. Yeah. It's an I sound is in yeah. E in Spanish, Mitla. One thing I will tell you from the bonus, two little things, one about the Francisco here and one about Mitla. Mm-hmm. Francisco was born and died in Mexico. Mm-hmm. So he wasn't, I mean, he was Spanish. Spanish but, descent, first generation. <laughs> yeah, but technically born and died there. Yeah. And yeah. back then they didn't call it Mexico, of course. They called it New Spain. Mm, right. And... Oaxaca wasn't called Oaxaca. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I've got it in my notes for the bonus, so let me look at that up real quick. Oaxaca was actually called Antiquera. Oh, okay. That was the name of the province. Okay. Um, I don't know when they changed it to Oaxaca. 
they found these things using, again, the legend for where they think it was. Mm -hmm. And then they used a combination of ground penetrating radar, electrical resistivity tomography, which is just mapping is the famous fancy word for tomography mm-hmm. uh, and seismic noise tomography to create an accurate 3d model of what lies oh, beneath the ground okay cool so we've talked about ground penetrating radar yep. they're dragging this box across the ground essentially or mm-hmm. not necessarily dragging sometimes it's it's off the ground by just a little bit but basically they're shooting down radar getting signatures back and you mm-hmm. get these parabolic shaped signatures on mm-hmm. there that you can tell if you know what you're looking for kind of what's down there yeah. you can see big openings and, and stuff like that and mm-hmm. really with radar or ground penetrating radar, you can see more defined like objects and and you know soil changes and just stuff that it's reflecting off of. Yeah, totally. Resistivity is also good for soil changes, like type of soil changes or finding openings where there are no soil. Mm-hmm. It has just different indications. And then of course the seismic is also good for that as well. Seismic right. has different you know rock densities and it's just shooting waves down into the ground, whether it's through pounding like they do for seismic testing for mines mm-hmm. or some other way. I don't really know what the other ways are. But they will do that. And then they took all these things and put them together for this accurate 3D model. Mm -hmm. And what they found is in actually the press release. So go check that out. The existence of extensive underground chambers and tunnels beneath the church group Hmm. that nobody's ever been in. At least not since the 1600s, apparently. Well, they need to find that door, that door to hell, apparently. That's what I'm saying. (laughs) And that's what I don't get is it never mentioned that they actually found the door, which was sealed off but what does sealed off mean yeah yeah did they pile a bunch of rocks in front of it or something maybe it was already a stone door yeah like do you have to seal off a stone door how do you even open that but yeah. anyway it's very indiana jones mm-hmm. so very appropriate that is very indiana jones yeah. yeah anyway they feel like the findings here would rewrite somewhat the history of the mitla ruins in mexico because mm-hmm. this might predate the zapotec people right it might have been them who knows yeah and if they can get into those caverns and start doing at least like a survey of a sort and excavation where mm-hmm. appropriate, they might be able to find a whole lot about the people that were using that space. So yeah, it's just a matter of finding an entrance to it at this point, I think. They yeah, know it's sure. there, but how do you get in? I know. Yeah. So they also found under the main altar of the Catholic Church, the large void that appeared to be connected with another geophysical anomaly north of the church. Mm-hmm. So large voids, chambers, all kinds of stuff they're finding here. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And there's no way to tell whether these are old man-made chambers and passages from past, you know, iterations of the building or if it's like actual caves that are natural features. No, this isn't Star Trek where they can just like (laughs) use a ship from outer space to to, to To like like map an entire underground system. (laughs) Right. All they know is there's basically space underground. Captain, there's walls and passages. If you go to the left, (laughs) uh, you'll see. No. So right. anyway, they also revealed, coincidentally, an east-west passage or two east-west passages mm-hmm. that are 16 to 26 feet below the ground. OK. Yeah. So lots of cool stuff here. Yeah. I wonder if one of those passages maybe goes out to a point where they can gain entry far away from the right. complex that is underneath. You know, maybe that'll be their way to get into it. Yeah. I don't know. The team was quoted as saying. Uh, a couple things here. First, the arrangement of chambers and tunnels underneath the church displays a far greater and more complex articulation than the relatively simple cruciform chambers that exist under the columns group and uh, in other okay. parts of the site. Okay. So a cruciform chambers just literally in the shape of a cross right. mm-hmm. where it could have been storage, could have been tombs. There, mm-hmm. there were tombs here. This is what this whole place is for. Mm-hmm. And they're saying that these are just a lot more detailed a lot and more complex. Indicating they're either natural or probably made by... A yeah. group of people that maybe didn't didn't have the church as their guiding force because the yeah. the cross shaped ones underneath churches were cross shaped on purpose, right? Like they they did that to match the shape of the church and maybe yeah. No, I mean if, if it was made by the Spanish, yeah, yeah probably. That's what I mean. Like yeah. if it was Spanish constructed, yeah. yeah, yeah. But if it wasn't, it's just a it's an easy shape to make. That's true. You yeah. Know? They also say that both the depth and orientation of the newly identified chamber suggest that they may not have been originally connected to the buildings above ground. So built mm. separately. Mm-hmm. You know, they did these chambers and maybe there was something, but tore those down and built something else. Yeah. So that doesn't seem to have anything to do with one with the other. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They haven't actually explored these subterranean chambers yet. This was just kind of the first phase. And from what I under- understand, it re- literally just got done not yeah. too long ago. Yeah. They plan to go back in September and search additional groups of buildings. So they're going to do this whole subterranean survey first, mm-hmm. this geophysical survey. And then probably go back and do some stuff because yeah. you know it's all about funding. There's actually three different organizations here that are that are going together to do this, mm-hmm. so it's it's pretty big. Yeah. But you know they say in there that they don't plan to physically explore the back door to hell anytime soon. On the one Why hand, I'm not? like, yeah, I kind of get it. It's a back door to hell. But on the other hand, it's like <laughs> this is 
This is it. And I actually wrote down in our notes here because we just we watched some of the Indiana Jones movies over again in preparation for Indiana Jones 5. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things that he says Indiana Jones does in the first one in Raiders when the government approves him to go search for the Ark and find what's his name. He's like, this represents everything we got into archaeology for in the first place. It just made me think of that quote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but this kind of does, right? Like a whole system of caves that might have been used by an ancient yeah. group of people. And yeah. we don't know what they used it for. And we might be able to get access to it. And it's it's like it represents a, a potentially pristine, yeah. pristinely preserved archaeological site. I mean, who wouldn't want to get in there and, and start working on it? I know. I mean, I guess the logistics of it are pretty complicated because it'll be solid darkness, probably <laughs> small spaces, probably somewhat dangerous. So like there's yes. probably a lot of logistical complications to, to get through. But man, if they could figure it out, I bet there's a lot to be learned from it. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, we're going to go from old Mexico or New Spain all the way over to a Dutch Stonehenge, mm-hmm. which sounds pretty cool. So we're going to go from the back door to hell to using the sun, but it's all, I don't know, it's all religious. Take a drink. <laughs> Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Well, we got a minute. I'm going to buy that truck I've been wanting. Wait, don't you need, like, weeks to shop for a car? I don't. Carvana makes it super convenient to find exactly what I want. Hold up. You're buying a car on your phone? Isn't that more of a laptop thing? You can shop wherever you want. I like to do my research, read reviews, compare models. Plus, Carvana has thousands of options. How'd you decide on that truck? Because I like it. Oh, that is a great reason. Go to Carvana.com to sell your car the convenient way. Welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 225. And we are... Again, talking about religion, because mm-hmm. if you don't know what it was for, it was definitely religion. It was definitely religion. And I'm going to take a drink right Oh, now. yeah. Here. Hold on. It's I got my water bottle. <laughs> and water. So it's not very exciting. It's, it's like Saturday morning. It's a ritual drinking game. <laughs> yeah, it's Saturday morning for us, which, uh-huh. you know, hasn't really stopped some archaeologists. Oh, uh, but... yeah. I could do a mimosa right now. Oh, like... <laughs> you don't have any orange juice. I don't. Right. So not going to happen. You know who else didn't have orange juice? <laughs> the early Dutch. What did they have? What kind of transition was that? That was they so had, lame. Uh, they had something that led an orange thing to them, but you know, oh, maybe man. yellow. That, that was know. like William of Orange. Is that what you're going for? No, the sun. Oh, the sun. Oh, <laughs> wow. That was really bad. Or maybe I'm really bad. I don't really know which one was worse there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So this article is called Archaeologists Discover 4,000 Year Old Dutch Stonehenge. And it was published in Smithsonian. And of course, you know, these things, people love to compare the thing to something that people already know. So that's why they compare it to Stonehenge. But there are some like interesting similarities here. So I don't yeah. think it's a, a bad or wrong comparison. It's just people know Stonehenge. Yeah, yeah, you not know it. Not just archaeologists, they're not comparing yeah. it to Stonehenge. And you can visualize in your brain like this, the standing stones in a circle thing yeah. of Stonehenge. And so for this, you can kind of visualize the same thing, except all we have left of it are mounds covered in grass, basically. Yeah. And and some a couple other things. So we'll talk about that as we get going here. But that's what should be in your head is like a, a mound shape in dirt, basically. Lots of things in archaeology are mound shaped. Yes. <laughs> a lot of mounds. <laughs> a lot of mounds. Yeah. So Dutch archaeologists have found a 4,000 year old site that could have been used to track the summer and winter solstices. And of course, they're calling it a ritual site, which I said, cue the drinking game in my notes here, but ritual. we don't really need to drink. We already drink about it once. <laughs> I'll drink again. Okay, drink again. So it's located in the Dutch municipality of Tiel? 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 T-I-E-L. Yeah, I don't know. And it's a very large site. It's approximately nine acres or about seven football fields. In that area, there are three large mounds of soil that are making up the main part of the site. Just so you know, football fields was a common unit of measurement 4,000 years ago when the... Uh the early I knew Dutch. you were going to say something about that. <laughs> you really have a bone to pick with the whole football field measurement thing. Like, does everybody just know how big of a uh, Nate, how much volume a football field takes up? I mean, I guess probably. Uh, yeah, you can kind of like see it, right? Like, yeah. oh, three football fields, or sorry, seven football fields. That's you know quite large. But like, 
Smithsonian is writing this, which is based in the United States, but are they writing it based on something that was written over in Europe? Because football field is a very different thing in Europe it is. than it is over No, here. actually, I wrote football fields knowing that we're American and most of our audience is American, uh, but it does say American football fields okay. in the article. Okay. <laughs> they specified. We they specified. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so in these mounds, there were approximately 60 adults and children buried in in and around it, right? Yeah. And they date to somewhere between 2500 and 1200 BCE. Okay. So quite a, a large time spread there. They probably occupied this area for a while. Either different groups of people kept coming back to it and kept using it, or it was the same group of people who used it for that length of time. It, it's possible either one, really. To me, that seems unlikely, only because there's yeah. only 60 people there buried over well over a thousand years why so few people yeah it seems like people rediscovered it periodically that's true and kept coming back to and it. i do kind of wish that they had touched on the burials a little bit more in the article but they portray them as all being buried somewhat in the same fetal position with their knees sort of drawn up towards their chest and in some cases the hands were like pillowed under the head the way you would when you're side sleeping yeah. you know so that's a very purposeful way to place the bodies and i'm like well we're were all the bodies from 2500 BCE placed that way and then the later yeah. ones were different or vice versa. So a little bit more information about that would have been interesting. You know, every time I read the word fetal and I know we're talking about burials, I read it as fatal. So I'm like, <laughs> they were all in the fatal position. I'm like, what other position like would they be in? It's a burial. <laughs> I mean, uh, why else wouldn't you put people in the fatal position? They're right. dead. Yes. Yeah. Right, right. right after you sacrificed them, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So here's what's interesting about these mountains. They seem to form pathways for the sun to shine through to the center of the mound on the shortest and longest days of the year. Yeah. And there's actually a really cool YouTube video in the article that that shows us very well. It's in Dutch, but if you go to the video in the, the caption settings, you can turn on the English subtitles, which is what I ended up doing to you know, try to understand yeah. what the video is saying. Yeah, so it's like two minutes long and it's yeah. uh, fairly well done and they show the kind of reconstruction what yeah. it looks like, but also the excavation itself, yeah. uh, which is pretty neat. Yeah, it was really cool. And that's where they showed the shape of the bodies, too, and how they were placed. Some of them mm -hmm. were apparently placed in this this dome-shaped mound of dirt, essentially. Yeah. But so you can visualize it for those that haven't had a chance to see the video. Imagine a dome-shaped circular hill with a ditch around the edge, but the ditch isn't fully complete. It has these pathways that are broken you know, almost like a dotted line kind mm -hmm. of all the way around the edge of the circle. And that allows the sun to shine through at certain points that correspond with the solstices. Right. Now, this is where I wanted to ask your opinion on that, because you watched the video and you saw how it looks like ditches in like dashed ditches all the way around the mound in the video. Uh, yes. And in this picture, though, it looks like it's actually mounds all the way around with ditches breaking up that mound that, that circular mound that makes sense because yeah. once they hold the dirt away the mounds yeah. make the ditch when you dig something out you make the mound it, and yeah. you end up with two different features yeah exactly so i think that the video might be a little bit misleading the the artist recreation which is also really really great and it's the, the featured image for this article that really gives me like the mental idea of what they're saying is going on here because rather than having ditches all the way around it, it a mound that is broken up by ditches right. and then through those ditches that break up the, the, the mound on the outside, you can see the sun. Right. If, if I'm understanding this recreation yeah. correctly. So that's how I would imagine it. And that's where you get that sort of, Stonehenge idea because Stonehenge the the sun was directed through the stones at various points right this is directing it the same way but it's through a mound of dirt and it also there's the remains of wooden posts along edges as well that would have helped to direct the sunlight at certain times of year of yeah, the year something that's cool to think about with these two is in order for them to say that this was solstice related mm -hmm. or, or even sun related and to make some sort of correlation, you can't really do it based on where the sun is now. No, you know, you gotta, yeah. gotta use your anakithra <laughs> mechanism to back up the sun wow. Wow. to see what it was like 2,500 yeah. or, or 5,000 years ago. You could just use one of the time fishers it points to to just go there. <laughs> yeah, totally. Psych. That sounds like the more fun fun way to do it. <laughs> Psych, you're in Syracuse. Yeah. So anyway. Oh my God. Hey, that's a really big spoiler right there. <laughs> I hope people have seen the movie by now. I don't know what movie you're talking about. Oh, okay, anyway, cool. Got it. So 
Yeah, it's pretty cool because they, they really do have to look back in time and say, here's where the sun was here because the sun yeah. goes through somewhat of a, I think it's a 26,000 year cycle where it kind of bobs up and down. Well, the solar system does. Mm -hmm. and, and then the earth has its own little wobble going on. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, the sun's not exactly in the same spot year after year. We don't notice it because of the span of your lifetime. Right. It's going to be in the same spot. But over the span of 4,000 years, it could have moved enough to where you're like, this doesn't line up. Yeah, but totally. But it did line up. Yeah. Yeah. Does the polarity of the Earth matter for that too? Because that changes slightly over time as well, right? Well, it, it does move and then it flips up suddenly yeah. um, at some point, yeah. but that wouldn't matter. It wouldn't matter for the sun position. Not for this, oh, not because for the, this okay. has nothing to do with magnetism. Okay, that yeah. was like having a little bit of knowledge about something and then like... It's Shut down completely. <laughs> yeah, like it's yeah. dangerous. Right. So, okay, well that's cool. Now, knowing the time of year would have been very important to the people living in this area because they would have been, you know, relying on farming to survive, obviously. And excavations in the nearby town of TL have yielded artifacts from all ages. So people lived in this area for a really long time. Mm -hmm. We've got all of them. We've got Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, Roman, and Middle Age. Like, all of it. So Middle Ages, yeah. Yeah. Middle yeah. Aged people definitely hear that. <laughs> but, uh, yes. yeah. You know, this... <laughs> You always hear this BS about farmers needing to know via some huge circle and a priest when to plant their crops. <laughs> but I guarantee these people living off the land were like, all right, well, it was cold and snowy. Now it's not. Uh -huh. I guess we'll plant. Yeah. Right. You're not just going to toss crops in the ground because you had one nice day. You know how long it lasts. Right. You can keep track of that. They might not have needed it to know specifically when to do the things that they had to do or, but it, like they say, maybe it was a ritual thing and like they yeah. have a, a party. They've got a spring party and a fall party, right. you know, based around that, this, you know, that I could see a little more. Yeah. You know, it's, it's because it is their entire livelihood. Mm -hmm. If they have a bad crop, everybody dies. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, you want to, get favor from the gods and, and or God or whatever you had back then yeah. and say, Hey, help us out. We love you. Mm -hmm. Love us back with crops. Yeah. And actually thinking about it too, if, if it really is only showing the solstices, not the equinoxes as well, I didn't mention the equinoxes. So solstices would be midsummer and then mm -hmm. midwinter, which does, I mean, that's like sort of when you're, you've already planted and things yeah. are growing. So it probably was just marking a festival to hopefully pray for good growth maybe yeah. i don't know and then in the winter you know it's after everything is all done and you're settling in so yeah, yeah. the cool thing is another thing they found was a, a glass bead yeah and it's the oldest one ever found in the netherlands but it also appears to be from iraq yeah and which is over three thousand miles away showing yeah. not necessarily that somebody traveled to iraq or that not, or somebody from iraq traveled to here but mm -hmm. there's interconnectedness and the, yeah. the bead along with other things probably could have been traded yeah you know. it's like that levels of trading like trade from yeah. here to 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 here and then all of a sudden it's moved three thousand miles it's yeah. kind of insane to think about that well that mm -hmm. makes you wonder like how long did it take to happen it didn't yeah. happen over the course of a year probably yeah it could have taken centuries that's a good point and so this bead that they found in association with they didn't mention how old it was in the article but let's just say it was associated with a burial from 2000 years ago yeah. then it actually could be significantly older than that the bead could be because it took right. that long to get from one place to another place and they probably treasured something like this that they would have never seen before glass was not something that was made in that area at that time so it would have been super unique probably very valuable and like very special, you know, so mm -hmm. it probably was handed down from person to person for a long time. Who knows how old the bead was compared to wherever it was found. Yeah. When you think about that, you know, people were living till what, 32, 33 oh this time? Oh my God. So. <laughs> Do you, you know how much that annoys me. Well, anyway. I'm going to have a myth busting episode soon <laughs> right. about the age of people and <laughs> when right. they died. But anyway. Yeah. That yeah. Uh, Dominican priest from the first uh, episode died at like 81 or something yeah, like that right? in the like 1600s. 400 yeah. years ago and yeah. he lived a nice long life. Come or on. 1500s. Yeah. yeah. No, 1600s. He died in the 1600s. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. It's really cool thinking about how long it could have taken that. This isn't an article about trade, but it's really sparking this conversation it because, is. Yeah. you know, we watched, I don't know, when we had dinner with my parents mm -hmm. a couple of times, they just like are binge watching Antiques Roadshow. Yeah. And you look at these things and some people are like, oh, I got this from my mother 85 years ago. Yeah. You know, when I was a child, she's dead now and now mm -hmm. I have it. And mm -hmm. that's one transmission of an object. 
you know, and then now they're going to give it to somebody and mm-hmm. maybe they have it until they're 80 or 90 or 100, however long people are going to live. Mm-hmm. And then maybe that gets handed down again. So over the course of 300 years, it could have passed through three different hands only. Yeah. You know, maybe four. Yeah. It just, things don't have to travel quickly. Yeah, totally. So, That's very yeah. true. Especially like you said, something that would have been more treasured, you mm-hmm. know, and you maybe would have only gotten rid of it if it's desperate times and somebody's got something you really need. You yeah. Know? Or like one of those like huge jerk family members who was like, I will be buried with this. You right. may not have it. And then like it's gone forever until we find it in the soil 500 right. years later exactly, <laughs> or whatever, however long it was. All right. Well, that was fun. But now we're going to jump back 39,000 years and talk about the, the age, age of bamboo. bamboo. Ooh. Back in a minute. Is your vehicle stopping like it should? Does it squeal or grind when you brake? Don't miss out on summer brake deals at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Save on O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner. Get two cans of O'Reilly Brake Parts Cleaner for just $8. Valid in-store only at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. Welcome back to the Archaeology Show, episode 225. And we are talking about uh, another article here from Popular Science, actually. But they link to the Plus One article, so go check that out, because Mm -hmm. we do too. And this is actually pretty cool, because it really gets to something that is frustrating as Mm -hmm. archaeologists, and why we're always talking about stone tools. And the reason we're always talking about stone tools is because almost nothing else survives in the archaeological the record. missing majority. Yep. When I heard that phrase for the first time, <laughs> I was like, oh my God, where has that phrase yeah. been my entire life and career? Because that is, it's it's so true. We yeah. don't have anything except for these really solid, hard artifacts that survive yeah. or have excellent preservation randomly. Yeah. Trees, plants, anything green matter, they call it. Mm-hmm. Almost all of that. And the products of those things, like mm-hmm. baskets and things like that, ropes, arrow shafts, spears, other wooden and woven things. Clothing, the all clothing, of it. Almost yeah. none of it survives unless it's in the exact perfect environment. And even then, there's kind of a time limit on that. Yeah. You know, it's mm-hmm. just it's just going to break down. It's organic material. Yep. You know, so totally. uh, the only time organic material can persist is when it's burned. But then it's almost unrecognizable. Yeah. And then you don't really yeah. have the artifact. It's charcoal. You, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like sometimes you can kind of see the shape of things. And if it's a very partial burn situation, you might be able to see decoration and stuff yeah. still. But yeah, like that is, yeah. Right. And what's even worse for these types of things is warm, humid air. It just mm-hmm. breaks them down that much quicker. Yep. We, we found, not we, but archaeologists have found, especially like in the Nevada deserts, baskets and duck decoys and things like that, like Lovelock Cave in, mm-hmm. in northern central Nevada, actually not that far from Reno. Mm-hmm. They found duck decoys, like literally reed duck decoys, mm-hmm. you know, shaped like Super ducks cool. so they could, you know, hunt ducks yeah. and baskets and other things in caves. Mm-hmm. And these are, you know, thousands of years old, but only because it's this this really dark, dry environment mm-hmm. hasn't been broken down by the sun and it's been, you know, relatively dry yep. and mm-hmm. it just helps, helps the arrest the breakdown process. Yeah, we talk about the the desert environment being great for preservation, but Mm -hmm. it needs to be desert environment, also not in the sun. (laughs) So a cave or covered in some way because the sun is pretty damaging no matter what the the air circumstances are like. Well, researchers writing in PLOS One, speaking of human environments, last week, actually, this came out, have observed some interesting evidence in the Philippines. Oh, They found fine traces of archaic plant scrapes, actually. Scrapes? scraps. It's scrapes. You'll see why in a minute. Okay. All right. Um, Stuck to three stone tools. Now, the the writing on this this popular science article was a little bit confusing. Mm -hmm. That's why we're talking about it. One of the reasons, because they kind of made it sound like there was actual microscopic plant fibers attached to these stones, but that's not what I got out of it. Okay. Especially reading on a little bit later. Okay. Anyway, they found stone tools that had indications of the tools being made to process plant material. Okay. And that's unique. Yeah. We'll get more on that. Mm -hmm. The tools were found in Tabon Cave, and that's located in what's called the Palawan province of the Western Philippines. So they carbon dated, again, in the article it says they carbon dated the tools. Mm -hmm. They did not carbon date stone tools. No, they did not. You cannot do that. There's no carbon in them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So... You could relative date them. Right. But. So they dated something around it in this excavation. And that came to around 39,000 years or at least 39,000 years. It's very old. And that's 
actually getting to the point where carbon dating starts to lose its effectiveness. It's only good out to about 55,000 yeah, years. Yeah. And when I say good, that's like minimally good. Mm -hmm. You know, they're getting better at basically counting and, and stuff like that for the the C14 molecules. Mm -hmm. But right. uh, it's still really hard. Mm -hmm. So anyway, the oldest evidence prior to that, that and there's they're kind of indicating this is like everywhere for mm -hmm. all time is 8,000 year old fragments of mats found in southern China. Which wow. is super cool. That, that the Chinese, if I were to like characterize the Chinese right now, I would say similar to the Japanese, you know, like T type huts and and having mats and sitting on their knees on the ground and doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And eight thousand years ago, the Chinese were still doing the same right. thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't know what those are used it's for. A way of life for but sure. But the fact that they found yeah. these mats, it's just you know, tradition is so big in Asian countries mm -hmm. and uh, lots of others too. But mm -hmm. it's been so much longer here. I feel like I just it, the, well, the history of that area just fascinates and me. And there, it's such a long history. There's That's been people with the ability to create those kind of well pieces for a really really long time. And we get to that yeah. uh, near the end of this article, too. Yeah. So unlike Africa and Europe, though, the stone tool industry in Southeast Asia isn't very standardized. Oh, okay. There's a diversity of shapes and sizes. And the researchers think that that might be due to some of the stuff they found in this article, meaning the people were adapting to very different environments and uh -huh. adapting to different environments, even on the same landscape. Mm -hmm. So they didn't have like standardized tools that kind of work for everything. That reminds me, there was an article that we'll probably talk about next week because it's kind of all over the place right now. But this was all over the place last week and we didn't talk about it mm -hmm. because of Indiana Jones. But it's about giant hand axes being found in England. Oh, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. We, need yeah, to we that do one. need to talk about that one. Right. I wasn't, I, yeah, it looked more like a press release, like more needed yeah. to come out about it. But, but the yeah. thing is, the hand axe, the reason I'm mentioning that is just like everywhere in Europe. Yeah. For thousands is. of years. Yeah. Tens of thousands of it's years. It's very easy to identify. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a long, a huge body of research around it, too. Yeah. So you can easily Massive. know what you're you're looking at when you see it. Yeah, it's a really long history. Yeah. So <laughs> they say because of these different shapes and sizes and the environment that they lived in and mm -hmm. really the need to process plant material because it was literally everywhere. Because so much of it. Yeah. yeah. The researchers called it, said they may have spurred an age of bamboo when they really started figuring this stuff out. Mm. Yeah. So that is super interesting because if the majority resource in your area is plant based yeah. and bamboo is a very, very strong plant yeah. that you can do a lot with, it makes sense that it would have played a large role in basically everything that they did, including mm -hmm. tools and hunting and that type of thing. And yeah. and probably different groups of people figured out different ways of using it, which is why we end up with a variety of different tools and shapes and types right. of things. That's that's a super cool sort of I don't know if it's a innovation. Probably a lot of people in that area have known about that idea. But to me, that's a new idea. That's yeah. really neat. Yeah. No, it's yeah. super cool. They said that. Uh, you know, obviously, like we just said, they mm -hmm. would have heavily relied on the bamboo for various uses, mm -hmm. not just a few things, but yeah, lots yeah. of different things. And a quote from one of the researchers said here, and, and he's not wrong, mastering fiber technology was a very important step in human development. Mm -hmm. and that's been true pretty much everywhere. He mm -hmm. um, goes on to say uh, it meant that people had the potential and the capacity to make objects from multiple parts bound by fiber. They could build complex houses and structures, make baskets and traps, string bows to hunt, mm -hmm. rig sails for boats, and even build the boats. Yeah. Yeah. Bamboo is such a versatile both wood and fiber like there's a, a i mean not to go into knitting world but i always take it to the knitting world when i can My God. <laughs> but there are a lot of bamboo yarns out there and it is a delightfully soft yarn that is wonderful to work with and to wear and yeah. it's just the like fibrous inside of the bamboo is how they make it and these days they they strengthen it with nylon and some other things too but i'm sure even back then it could have been used to to make a, a fabric of sorts it's just, unfortunately, we don't have any remnants of it right. because it does not preserve well. No, you know, sure it away. Yeah. Though, so in order to figure all this out, they showed, they looked at microscopic evidence of wear and tear associated with fiber technology. Okay. And so what does that mean? So they looked at current plant processing, processing techniques by indigenous communities in the area that are okay. still doing this, yeah. right? They're still... I don't want to use the word primitive, but, you mm -hmm. know, not like first world society. Traditional techniques. Yeah. Still yeah. doing this very same thing yeah. uh, in the Philippines and beyond. Mm -hmm. And but they looked in the area of this cave uh, that these things were found and 
they did multiple surveys and field work sessions in this rainforest mm-hmm. to find the signatures of these different plants and fiber technologies. Okay. So they made their own stone tools and basically did some processing of this stuff and built this huge database mm-hmm. so they could then take the stone tools that they did find and the wear patterns that they found on those and then using optical, digital, and scanning electron microscopes they found consistent patterns on those tools from 39,000 years ago okay. that match what they found today through experimental evidence. Uh, experimental archaeology yeah. for the yeah. win. Always. I love it. Yeah. And people were, what were they were doing with those? They were taking palm and bamboo. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of palm leaves there too. Oh, palm, sure. I guess fibers from the from the leaf stalks because they're huge. Oh, okay. And I don't know if they did anything with the tree, but probably. Yeah. They would strip them down and the stems are turned into supple fibers for weaving mm-hmm. uh, or tying things. Mm-hmm. So, Making rope and all that kind of stuff yeah. probably. Yeah. Yeah. Fast Fastening together poles and things for houses. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. So what they were really saying, which leads back to what we were saying earlier about 8,000 year old mats in China and how the traditions go back so far. They're saying, you know, they're speculating on whether or not this plant based technology was persistent Mm -hmm. between now and then and beyond, obviously, Mm -hmm. for literally hundreds and hundreds of generations. Or was it discovered and forgotten over and over and over again? But Mm -hmm. now that they know what they're looking for, they might be able to reanalyze some other collections where similar tools have been found. Yep. Take a look at them and say, oh, yep, there's the telltale signature of this was used Mm -hmm. for plants. That's super cool. And it it makes me wonder what's been done in other areas. Like like take a scraper, for example. Right. It's a pretty common stone tool is used for scraping things. But those things could be hides. It could be plant matter. It could be a lot of things that need scraping. So now mm-hmm. I'm interested to know if other assemblages around the world, different people, different places, if if you can do a similar kind of study to find out what they were scraping right. just by the shape of the use wear. I, I love that idea. That's yeah. so cool. It gives you a little window into that missing majority again, because obviously we're not going to have any remains from the things that they were making with those tools. But the wear patterns on the tools might tell us a little bit more about what they were doing. Yes. Awesome. Love Pretty it. Pretty cool. Brings experimental archaeology into play, technology into yeah, play. Yeah, totally. Ethno, arche, ethno, ethnography. Ethnography. Is the word I'm trying to yes, think of. ethnography. Yeah. yeah. Um, or really, kind of ethno archaeology. I've heard is the phrase where mm. they they look at groups and and writings recently of groups in the last uh-huh. couple hundred years where people observe this kind of behavior and then try to replicate that through experimental archaeology. Totally. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. neat. Very cool. All right. Well, that's it for this week. And keep in mind, if you are a member, arcpodnet.com forward slash members, if you're not, there is a bonus segment. We are going to have video of the bonus segment as well. That will not be on YouTube. Well, it will be, but you won't be able to find it unless you're a member. <laughs> so, uh, and for members too, this is actually, there is a bonus area on the member pages, but the bonus segments, just to keep them with the episode and not separate them from the episode and put them in the bonus area, the bonus area is more for one-off like, things. Like whole episodes yeah. that are bonus. Exactly. Yeah. The bonus segment for this will, and the video, you'll be playable right on uh, the Archaeology Podcast Network, and it's still called like HQ Downloads, I think, mm-hmm. or something like that. But just look on your bonus pages and look for the uh, early downloads, mm-hmm. right? So you'll find this over there, and that's where the bonus segment will be. Yep. So. All right, so in the bonus segment, we're going to talk about a little of the history and life of the of the monk, of the Dominican priest that we taught. I keep calling him a monk. I don't know why. <laughs> and then also of Mitla from Mexico. Anyway, so we're going to talk about that in the bonus. And with that, we're out. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Archaeology Show. Feel free to comment and view the show notes on the website at www.arcpodnet.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at ArcPodNet. Music for this show is called I Wish You Would Look from the band Sea Hero. Again, thanks for listening and have an awesome day. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Chris Webster. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.